start our discussion of reproduction with female reproductive anatomy. Reproduction is the creation of a new human being. In the case of humans and most animals, sexual reproduction requires both a male and female counterpart of the species. The female is going to produce or contribute the eggs to the process. The males are going to produce the sperm cells. So let's take a look at the female reproductive anatomy. And I do want to say that all of these subsequent images are of reproductive anatomy, so they are probably not appropriate for young children, unless, of course, you're accompanying your young children to use this as education. And if this is, and this certainly could be triggering for some other people. So uh, please keep that in mind and proceed with caution. Okay, let's take a look at the basic arrangement of these female reproductive structures. Not all these structures in this image are reproductive structures. This right here represents the rectum and the sigmoid colon, which is not part of the reproductive system. This right here is the urinary bladder, which also is not part of the reproductive system. But the bladder is immediately adjacent or anterior to the vagina and inferior to the uterus right here. And when we look at the inferior aspect of the perineum, we will see the external urethral orifice is in very close proximity to the vaginal orifice, which we see right here. So keep in mind, the urethra, the urethral orifice has no contribution to sexual reproduction in females. It does in males, and we'll look at that when we look at male reproductive anatomy. This right here is part of the pelvic bone directly on the anterior and inferior aspect of the pelvic bone. We find skin overlaying fat with pubic hair growing out of it. And this is known as the mons pubis. So we have the mons pubis, the clitoris right here, bounding the vaginal orifice on both sides are the labia minora and labia majora. Keep in mind, we are only looking, at least within the pelvic cavity here, at a sagittal section. So we are looking at the right half of these organs and tissues. Th these labia or folds are paired. So there's going to be a right and left labia majora and a right and left labia minora. Typically, the labia majora is drawn larger than the labia minora, hence the name but it does not always follow that pattern. It's certainly possible for the labia minora, which is the innermost of the folds, to proceed more inferiorly than the labia majora. Once again, this is the vagina right here. The cervix would be right here. It's not really shown very well in this image. We'll look at a better image after this. This is a uterus fallopian tube coming off of the uterus, and this is the ovary right here. So we're gonna look at a more detailed image of the uterus, the fallopian tubes, and the ovaries shortly. We are now looking at the inferior image of the perineum, the inferior aspect of the pelvic region in the female. Right up here is the mons pubis, which is just anterior and superior to the vulva. The vulva are the external reproductive structures that we're looking at right here. In pink right here, we see the labia minora, which are the innermost folds that we looked at previously. And right here are the labia majora that bound the outside or lateral aspect of the labia majora. So we have, excuse me, of the labia minora. So labia majora right here, labia minora, labia minora, and labia majora. The space within or confined within the labia minora is known as the vestibule. And that includes the vaginal orifice that we see right here, and the external urethral orifice that we see right here. Anatomically speaking, the external urethral orifice is anterior to the vaginal orifice. So that's important to understand. If you visualize a previous image with the individual standing erect and facing to the left, the external urethral orifice is anterior and slightly superior to the vaginal orifice. This is representing the clitoris. The clitoris is homologous to the male penis. We haven't talked about male reproductive anatomy yet, but the penis is composed of three structures, two corpora cavernosa 
and one corpus spongiosum. The clitoris that we see right here does not contain the corpus spongiosum. The corpus spongiosum of the male penis contains the urethra, which is used both for the urinary system and reproductive system. Once again, this is the external urethral orifice. So the urethra and the corpus spongiosum don't play a part in the clitoris, but the clitoris has the two corpora cavernosa, which are the erectile tissue of the clitoris and of the homologous penis that engorge with blood during sexual stimulation. So I'm going to use the term homologous to suggest that they are deriving from the same embryonic origin. So during embryonic, embryonic development, at some point when there's a differentiation of that embryo to determine male or female, the embryonic structure that gives rise to the penis is the exact same embryonic structure that's going to give rise to the clitoris. And that's similar to the labia majora, which is homologous to the male scrotum. The male scrotum and the labia majora are deriving from the same embryonic tissue. To put things in perspective, this right here is the anus. So from posterior to anterior, we have the anus, vaginal orifice, external urethral orifice, and the clitoris. At the anterior aspect of the labia majora, where they meet anteriorly, they cover up the clitoris, creating what's known as a clitoral prepuce, similar to the prepuce or foreskin that covers the gland's penis. And then where the labia majora meet posteriorly is known as the fourchette. This image is similar to what we just previously looked at. We are looking at the vestibule in pink, but we have removed labia, both the labia majora and labia minora, to expose a couple of these glands right here. These right here are the two anatomate bones, the right and left anatomate bones making up the pelvic girdle. This right here is the pubic symphysis with some fibrocartilage between those bones. This is the clitoris right here. And once again, this is the vestibule, which is the space or region that is confined by the labia minora. Keep in mind, the labia minora is not shown in this image. This is the vaginal orifice. This is the external urethral orifice. This right here is known as the vestibular bulb, and this engorges with blood during sexual stimulation along with the clitoris. So the engorgement of blood of the vestibular bulbs help the vagina to constrict or tighten around the penis during sexual intercourse. Right down here are the greater vestibular bulbs, which help keep the vagina moist and help lubricate the vagina during sexual intercourse. And not shown right here are periurethral glands. And the periurethral glands, which sit on either side of the clitoris, and they open into the vestibule right here, and during sexual arousal can actually eject fluid, some eject fluid that would be the female ejaculate or female ejaculation. And these periurethral glands are homologous to the prostate gland in males. That is to say the periurethral glands in females and the prostate gland in males derive from the same embryonic tissue. Finally, let's take a look at the uterus, the vagina, the fallopian tubes, and the ovaries. So from here down to here is the uterus. These are the fallopian tubes right here on each side. These are ovaries. And this is the vagina right here. Between the vagina and the uterus in this region right here is this cervix. If we look at the vagina, the vagina is composed of a perimetrium, myometrium, and endometrium. The perimetrium, which we see right here and in dark on the sides right here, is serosa, that simple squamous epithelial tissue underlain by a loose areolar connective tissue. The endometrium, is simple columnar epithelial tissue. And that's what we see here in teal. A lot of the cells of this endometrium are ciliated. And between the endometrium and the parametrium, we find myometrium, which is smooth muscle. So we have parametrium, myometrium, and endometrium. Parametrium, myometrium, 
and endometrium. The endometrium is composed of two layers. One layer that's known as the stratum functionalis. The outermost or bottom layer is the stratum basale. So the stratum basale would be closer to the myometrium. The stratum basale contains stem cells that allow for regeneration of the stratum functionalis. The stratum functionalis is going to be shed off every 28 days in sexually mature females. This is known as menses. Once the stratum functionalis sheds off, the basal layer, the stratum basale, produces another stratum functionalis. And we'll talk about more about menses in a later video. Right here is the cervix. And the cervix has a superior aspect of it, which is known as the internal os, and an inferior aspect of it known as the external os. There are glands that line the cervix that secrete a mucus. And the goal of that mucus is to plug up the cervical canal to prevent any movement of pathogens up the cervix into the uterus during ovulation. Now, ovulation is the release of an egg from the ovary. Ovulation occurs every 28 days. To be clear, ovulation and menses or the menstrual cycle are very related to each other, but also very distinct processes. So during ovulation, which is the release of an egg from the ovary, which we see over here on the right, during ovulation, the, muc the cervical mucus thins out to allow for the potential passage of sperm cells through the cervical canal into the uterus and up into the fallopian tubes in the hopes of fertilizing that ovulated egg. If we go back to the uterus right here, this space right here is generally referred to as a potential space because in females, specifically females who have never been pregnant, the walls of the uterus, the stratum functionalis, are going to stick together because they are lined with mucus and fluid. Inferior to the cervix, we have the vagina. The vagina has rugae on it, so some rough kind of circular folds within the vagina that help stimulate the penis during sexual intercourse. The mucosa of the vagina is composed of stratified squamous epithelial tissue. The cervix, the lower half of the cervix is also composed of stratified squamous epithelial tissue. And the superior aspect of the cervix is composed of simple columnar epithelial tissue. But back to the vagina, during prepubescent females, that is to say females who have not yet achieved sexual maturity, the mucosa of the vagina is composed of simple cuboidal epithelial tissue. And during sexual maturation, that simple cuboidal epithelial tissue transitions into stratified squamous epithelial tissue, the conversion or transition from one tissue type to another, in this case, simple cuboidal to, to stratified squamous is known as metaplasia. The vagina also maintains a low pH and that is also to help deter any microorganisms or pathogens trying to enter the reproductive tract. Additionally, there are dendritic cells within the connective tissue lining the vagina and the dendritic cells are immune cells there that, and their main role is to activate other immune cells in times of infection. If we move back to the uterus, this curved part up here is known as the fundus and the great majority of the uterus is known as the body. And then once again, the inferior aspect of the uterus is the cervix. Coming off the cervix on each side are the fallopian tubes. They are also known as uterine tubes or oviducts. Where the fallopian tube leaves the uterus, this is known as the isthmus. The great majority of the fallopian tube is known as the ampulla. And then the distal end of the fallopian tubes are known as the infundibulum. The infundibulum give rise to the cilia or finger-like projections known as fimbriae. The fallopian tube is lined by simple cuboidal epithelial tissue, and it is ciliated. Here's the cilia, the simple cuboidal epithelial cells that line the fallopian tube. The fallopian tube also has 
smooth muscle lining the wall. And that smooth muscle is going to help the fallopian tube engage in peristaltic wave-like contractions to help propel the fertilized egg back into the uterus where it will implant on the stratum functionalis. Please keep in mind that fertilization generally occurs in the fallopian tube within the ampulla, but then that fertilized egg, which we refer to as a zygote, needs to make its way back into the uterus. And that's achieved by this peristaltic contractions of the fallopian tube in addition to the beating wave-like motion of the cilia. Once again, this is an ovary. Connecting the ovary to the uterus is the round ligament right here and right here. One thing not shown on this image is another ligament known as the broad ligament. And the broad ligament would prevent the ovaries from falling inferiorly like we see right here. So we have the round ligament right here and the broad ligament spans quite a range within this pelvic cavity around the uterus. This right here is showing an ovulated egg. It's really a primary or secondary oocyte, but for our purposes, let's call it an ovum or an egg. And the fimbri and the infundibulum are not physically connected to the ovary. Certainly they're probably gonna be closer than I have depicted in this image right here, but I just want to really focus or highlight the fact that the fimbria are not physically connected to the ovary. So during ovulation, that egg needs to be swept into the fallopian tube and then move from the fallopian tube back into the uterus upon fertilization. If fertilization does not occur, then we have the shedding of the stratum functionalis known as menses, and then the cycle begins again. And we're gonna talk about the cycle, both the ovarian cycle and the uterine cycle to get a better handle on that in a later video.